The views and opinions expressed in the following program do not necessarily reflect the policies and the position of Now You Know. Good morning and welcome to Viewpoint. Together with experts and newsmakers, we make sense of the week's biggest issues and stories. I'm Barnaby Lowe in today's conversation. Former Vice President and Democratic nominee Joe Biden has won the presidential race after a record voter turnout in the United States. After four tumultuous years with Donald Trump as the leader of the free world, Biden promised to defend democracy, restore decency, and the soul of America. It was a tight contest that the world watched with bated breath. In the Philippines, it sparked the hashtags Tainaman and Halalan 2022, with people encouraging each other to register and vote. But how exactly will this change in the U.S. government impact the Philippines? Biden is expected to give more attention to human rights issues a possible source of conflict with President Rodrigo Duterte. Other observers say, however, that Biden may choose not to rock the boat too much as America will want to keep traditional allies on its side. And joining us for this discussion this morning, we're doing it in the morning this time, is uh, Lila Shahani, who is a form, who is the Hello. former Secretary General of the UNESCO National Committee of the Philippines. She's joining us live from Seattle, Washington, in the USA. Good evening, Lila. Everyone. Thank you so Good much evening. for joining us. I know it's yeah. dinner time there, so we really appreciate yeah. that you're here with us. All right. Also joining us is former Comelec Commissioner, Attorney Gregorio Larazabal. Good morning, Tom. Uh -huh. Thanks very much for having me. It's a uh, thanks. Hi, good, good, good morning and good evening. <laughs> okay, may I call you Comgoyo for the yeah, duration sorry. of this show? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much to uh, the two of you for joining us on this show today. Um, but before we start the discussion, I'd like to take a moment to pray for the safety of our Kababayans in the Cagayan region, who are, of course, experiencing record flooding in their area right now. A lot of people on their roofs, a lot of people trapped in their homes needing rescue. I see the floodwaters already kind of receding and I see the national government already mobilizing rescue uh, and first responders for them. So that's, that's good, but a lot of people are still needing help there. So um, I hope that the local governments there can simplify uh, health protocols for our colleagues in the media so that they can get in there and be able to report on what's happening there, as well as for um, relief workers and aid workers and first responders. All right. Okay. So moving on back to the discussion on the uh, election of uh, U.S. President-elect Joe Biden and how it could impact the Philippines and the region around here. Um, I, I, I'd like to throw my first question to Lila because Lila, you're there in the U.S. So you probably, um, you're more knowledgeable about what's hap happening there. I'm not saying that Kongoyo, you're not knowledgeable about what's happening in the U.S. But Lila, 
is there in in the U.S. And uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, you also worked in the Biden Harris campaign as a volunteer, right? Okay. Yes. So yes. So the latest now is that uh, Biden has been projected to win Arizona and yes. Georgia. Yes. yes. So yeah. does that mean yeah. that there is no more, absolutely no more path to victory for Donald Trump? There's no more path to victory. Well, it's complicated. You know, it depends on on who you talk to. But uh, you know, there's a timeline uh, that I I kind of drew up for you. Um, okay. Yeah. So basically. Uh, Georgia, Arizona, by the end of November, uh, the certifications are going to come out. So even yeah. if, as you say now, um, it's already a done deal, you know, I'm telling you, it ain't over until the fat lady sings. We really don't know. I mean, the fact is Donald Trump is extremely popular. So, um, of course, uh, after Georgia and Arizona, uh, you know, then you're going to have by December 8, uh, even if uh, Trump tries to block the certifications uh, and tries to uh, say that there's evidence of wrongdoing, um, another deadline looming is December 8, which is the deadline to resolve any disputes. Right, and then by December 14, electors meet in their state capitals to cast their ballots. Okay, by December 23, it should all go to Pence, uh, Vice President Mike Pence. So, okay. uh, January 6 is when the joint session in Congress is going to take place where they formally count the ballots and prepare to resolve any final issues. So hypothetically, we can all breathe a sigh of relief uh, on January 20th. Now, um, yes. That's but, the day of the I mean, inauguration, right? I'm sorry? January. That's the day of the inauguration, right? The yes. 20th yes. of January? Okay. Yeah. Yep. So it would take that long for us to all be able to know the final result of this? Well, you know, I mean, even today, I mean, even Mitt Romney was saying that Trump, you know, Mitt Romney, Karl Rove, all these people have been saying, look, Trump should just read the writing on the wall, be gracious, and help the country in this very difficult transition that is rocked by COVID and, and race issues and economic downturns. Um, but even today, Trump said that you know he was not going to concede, and so um, I think I think um, everyone is reluctant to say what would happen if he didn't concede, because that's just uh, it would cause a lot, not just a constitutional crisis, it would uh, lead to a lot of. Uh, investment uncertainty and mm. just economic uncertainty in general. Kong mm. Goyo, uh, uh, as an external observer and as a former election commissioner here in the Philippines, are you seeing the same problems? Are you seeing the same complications? Or is it your view that the math just won't add up for Trump? Because I'm also seeing that, that view. Oops. I think, uh, Kom Goyo, we, we lost your audio right there. Okay. Um, we don't hear you, Kom? No. Um, okay. Um, I think we'll we'll have to fix that. I'll go back to Leela then, um, because you you mentioned the transition, right? Mm -hmm. um, Goyo, just just go ahead and and try to speak, and then when we hear you, I'll go back to you. Um, so just just go ahead and keep trying to uh, 
fix your your audio. But Lila, yes. So you mentioned transition, right? So you don't see a peaceful transition happening. Um, and, and and even the you know the the COVID team that Biden has formed, they they're saying that the White House won't work with them. So I mean, what does that bode for the transition? Okay. First of all, the problem is that. Uh, Biden is not included in critical presidential security briefings. And if you look at the 911 commission uh, in 2001, um, you know, they said that the fact that the transition was so complicated before George W. Bush uh, came into uh, his position, affected security issues. I mean, if I were an enemy of America, now would be the time to hit. The other Mm -hmm. thing is, you know, everyone is so excited. I mean, everyone I know is so excited about Biden and Harris. Uh, The first thing I would say is don't forget Barack Obama's second term. And don't forget that he didn't have the Senate. Right, and so you don't want a lame duck presidency. You don't want someone to be hamstrung by a Senate gridlock, right? So, mm. of course, Georgia. Well, we don't know that yet, right? Because there's going to be two runoffs in Georgia. Yeah, but it's yeah. it's really really important. And the other thing is, you know, uh, although I I. I deeply respect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, the truth is they're both centrists, right? And so in terms of progressive reforms, a lot will depend on their cabinet picks, mm. right? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not saying, but you know, like uh, right now, the head of the General Services Administration, she's not even recognizing Biden, right? And then Trump, fired uh you know the defense secretary there's there's talk that he might fire the head of the cia and the fbi so i i'm not saying it's not a done deal i'm saying that what i have learned in years of working in government and studying political science is that you can't stop being vigilant you know mm. that we have done that you know i mean we reformists always said oh, okay you know now we're fine you know we can relax actually yeah. surreptitiously waiting yeah. in the wings are this all is, kinds of nefarious forces i mean this is something new in the us but this is something that happens to us all the time every election cycle here in the philippines right uh com com goyo yeah. yeah can you hear me now <laughs> yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Yes, um, you know, in in most elections, man, there are there are issues regarding possible fraud, but mm-hmm. in the U.S. now, based on even the report of the DOJ uh, committee tasked to to evaluate the last election, they said there is no substantial fraud to warrant a uh, to warrant the overrule the over turning of results now you know at the end of the day it's people are just scared of people just want to placate the ego of president trump uh yeah. especially democrat um you know he, mm-hmm. he got 71 million votes and a lot of the republicans who won probably owe it to him and you know they're scared that he might turn on them and because of that they might lose another thing mm-hmm. is there's a runoff in Georgia for two Senate seats in on January 5. So the <laughs> assumption that you know you need to motivate you keep you need to keep the base interested in the elections, you need to keep them involved in the process so they will still go out on January 5. And the best way to do that is to allege fraud. If you allege fraud, you appeal to their emotions, they'll want to participate in the elections on January 5. It sounds an awful like the Philippines. Yeah, but then we say, <laughs> I'm sorry I'm laughing, but you know, it's, it yeah, really sounds an awful like the Philippines. But there, there's a there's a big difference because in the Philippines and other countries, 
uh, you, the candidate, spends for his electoral protest or whatever uh, election contest you file. In the U.S., it, they basically crowdsource from from supporters. So hmm. uh, Trump is uh, raising money now, alleging, you know, he's alleging fraud and raising money. But you know, I hope they realize that you know when you do, donate to that fund. That doesn't go to the election protest or litigation. That goes to other expenses incurred by the campaign of Do President Donald Trump. So it's just a way to siphon off money. Okay. Um, so so then what you're saying, both you, Com Goyo, and Lila, is that Trump is kind of performing for his base right now, although yes. he probably is aware that he doesn't have the numbers. No, but you know you have to look at it from one point, from several points of view. One is uh, there is talk that he will create his own media network, and you know yeah. if you have one million people who voted for you, that's a big market. And if you can corner that market, you can make a lot of money. The second is he. There have been reports already that he's 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 signal he's signaling that he wants to run again. Yeah. Twenty four. Yes. <laughs> Twenty four. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So. So how do you how do you how do you make sure that uh, people will still be at your side? You allege fraud and say that you know I didn't lose, I was cheated, and we can correct this wrong in twenty twenty four. Lila, you want to add something? I think. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So then, um, I think it'll be. Uh, I you know I said in the introduction of this episode that it it's been a tumultuous four years then it will still be a tumultuous two months all the way up to the inauguration but what does this mean because you know Filipinos were so excited about this election and a lot of Filipinos were so excited that Biden and Kamala Harris won the election and I, I think a lot of people here in the Philippines have already concluded that that's what's going to happen yeah right yes so yes. I mean so how, how does that influence how how Filipinos are going to conduct the election in 2022 or does it does it even matter because you know Filipinos are saying there's hope and you know there's hashtags uh, halalan 2002 and you know people encouraging other Filipinos to go register and vote you know so I mean what does that all mean to you uh, go okay um, in the Philippines and pretty much every country, the the big, bigger voter block is from 18 to 29. Unfortunately, as with other countries, the, the turnout of the voters between 18 to 29 is lower than do, those above 60, statistically, yeah, historically. Um, by, by showing people that the youth had a huge participation in these elections in the U.S., you can replicate that here. Uh, in the U.S., they have, I'm sure, Republicans and the Democrats, they have the Get Out and Vote, Get Out the Vote Act uh, program. And you can implement that here in the Philippines, you know, with some variances, to encourage the youth to participate in elections. You know, you make it hip. You make them understand that when you participate in these elections, it's it, you're, you're telling the world that, hey, I have a stake in my future. Are you saying that the Filipino youth uh, is leaning more towards, uh, you know, against the uh, administration or against authoritarianism and leaning more towards the characteristics of a Biden administration, which, you know, he said that he's going to bring back de decency. He's, he said he's going to restore democracy. That, that You're saying that the Filipino youth wants that for the Philippines? Well, the Fil you know, the younger voters generally want change they want change from the status quo uh and this is this not only with this admin but previous admins they generally want something new a new beginning um mm. so it doesn't necessarily matter who's there it's just that they want the new admin to bring something <laughs> new as compared to what they see now they want things mm. for the better they want to change things for the better and how do you do that by ushering in a new, a new admin, which might have different programs? Okay, uh, Lila, what what segment of voters really made the 
difference in in the in these U.S. elections that just has been concluded? Is it the youth, or I mean, because I've, I'm also hearing you know black voters uh, made uh, a lot of difference in states like Georgia and especially in cities like Atlanta. Um, and then as well as in Pennsylvania, um, and then Latino voters in Arizona. So is it necessarily the youth vote or is it necessarily a, a race vote in in the U.S.? Um, I think, well, it's, you know, the data is not really disaggregated, you know, by state. So it's a little difficult to make a, a kind of overarching analysis. But... It's interesting, the Asian American and Pacific Islanders really believe that they were the critical group because they've always been pretty apolitical uh, for yeah. many historical reasons and they've really rarely run for office relative to other ethnic groups. Um, and well, one group that was very, very strongly strong for Biden were suburban white women. Uh, they just really didn't like Mr. Trump. And that's why he would walk around saying, you know, white women can please like me. You know, um, I think, you know, the momentum of the Black Lives Matter movement um, has been very powerful. Uh, and, you know, I've witnessed it firsthand. I mean, in the height of COVID, people are marching, you know, and um, it's there's a lot of tension. Um, what is interesting is that, uh, you know, uh, when I was in college in the U.S., um, it was like Black slaves, Asians, and Latinos were considered to be the ethnic groups. And Native Americans were kind of not even part of the discussion. And what is interesting, so even in like social science literature, they make a distinction. Are you First Nation or are you a migrant, right? Mm. Uh, and what I like about sort of the post-Obama uh, platform is number one, they, um, they include a whole series of um, ethnic groups. Um, and number two, um, they are now focused not just on political representation, but on economic empowerment. But um, to answer your question, there are a lot of white people who are very anti-Trump at this point. Uh, and I think, um, you know, like, interestingly enough, within the Asian American community, there's so much, so many cleavages that the Vietnamese Americans are very pro-Trump in general. Filipino Americans are actually pretty much split. I mean, it's around... Actually, I want to understand that. Yeah. Um, because, um, you know... Before the election and during the election, there was a lot of there. There were a lot of um, articles about Filipinos being pro-Trump, but yeah. in fact, they're they're as divided as the rest of America, right? Yes. Uh, well, Filipinos have a particular pathology, which I don't really think I need to explain to you. But um, in any part of the world, they're always fighting, um, and that's just the way it is. Um, but I would say that uh, for Phil um, Republicans, the do or die issue was abortion. Uh, and uh, the fact that Biden was Catholic um, and himself didn't want, didn't believe in abortion, but he defended to the death the right of every woman to decide for herself what to do with her own body. That didn't go down very well with the Pinoy community here. Uh, they like Trump's lowering of the taxes, uh, especially for small business owners. They liked the, in the context of chaos, they liked the authoritarianism and I'm really sad to say that, you know, 
there are quite a few who are quite racist about blacks and Muslims. And I, I attribute that to a sense of precarity that they have uh, as people of color in America. So it becomes easier to um, scapegoat another. Mm. Um, and then, you know, some of them, you know, the demonization by Trump of China, they, they you know, it was very simplistic. They liked that, um, you know, um, and they, these are people who do not believe in but, WHO, NATO, the UN. Now, that's but I mean, very shouldn't, be the, shouldn't be the migrant issue like front and center for Filipinos, you know, being migrants themselves. Um, well, because I'm not hearing that. Well, you know, I mean, it's a classic imperial strategy to divide and conquer, right? So, uh, you know, the Vietnamese Americans really did not want Somali refugees to come to America, even if they are themselves predominantly a refugee community. And there is this notion of the good refugees and the not so good refugees, and we're good, you know? And um, so, yeah, there's that. Okay. Um, Kong yeah. Goyo, you're smiling. Uh, I can yeah. feel that you want to add something to that. <laughs> Um, you know what? If the Latino community in Florida simply went for Biden, this wouldn't have been uh, as debated as it would now because um, Trump basically won in Florida because of the Latino vote. Republicans are normally strong in the elderly voters, white 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 voters who retire in Florida, <laughs> but but Biden got a lot of those votes from Trump. Surprisingly, like I mentioned. <laughs> Trump got a lot of Latino voters because he just simply said the message that Biden is a socialist. Obviously, when yeah. you say, yeah, so, and, and that. So, but, but, then, but then Biden got the Latino votes in Arizona. So, uh, yeah, I mean, but let um, me say the, the Latino <laughs> voters in Florida specifically come from, many come from, can, flew, went, oh. came to India. Cubans and Venezuelans, right? Right. So, yeah. norm, so they got scared of that that label that uh, Biden is a socialist. He's a centrist, but it worked. It worked to the, the advantage of Trump. Mm. Uh, Lila, but Lila, as uh, someone who worked in the Biden Harris campaign, you wouldn't describe Biden as a socialist, would you? Oh, not at all. I mean, he's you know corporate uh, elite. Uh, you know. Socialism is kind of, a, I've lived in Romania and in Eastern Europe. So, you know, when you say social, or and I've been to Scandinavia, they're very different. I mean, you know, when Americans say socialism, it's a little funny, you know. Uh, You're saying they don't read it. Yeah. I just want to say that uh, it's really important when you look at the voting proclivities of certain uh, ethnic groups, a lot of it has to do with their countries of provenance. Okay, so for example, the Vietnamese were fleeing communism, they come here, anything that smacks of left-leaning talk uh, make them uncomfortable. Um, in the same way, I mean, uh, and, and, and that applies to Latinos, certainly. Um, so, and what, another thing I want to point out, uh, when we talk about race, you know, a lot of Asian Americans are very uncomfortable about the fact that Kamala Harris identifies herself as Black. She actually rarely, in terms of branding and messaging, mm -hmm rarely um, says that she's Asian, except, you know, we've pretty much pulled her into the discussion to say, hey, you know, your mother was a Tamil Brahmin, which is as elite as it gets in India. I'm half Indian, so, you know, it's as elite as it gets. And what is interesting about her, her 
I mean, her Jamaican father did not uh, spend much time with her. So she grew up with her uh, uh, Indian mother. And yet, interestingly enough, her mother brought her up to see herself as a black woman in the context of the civil rights movement. And she went to Howard. Now, um, interestingly enough, the head of the Asian American and Pacific Islander uh, coalition for Biden uh, is pro Narendra Modi. So in India, so you can see that, I mean, a lot of Muslims- I don't understand that. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, politicians, uh, you know, I mean, all human beings are morally flawed, you know, in one way or another. And and I think precisely what I'm trying to say now is that we need to temper our expectations. You know, when, Loyo, when you say uh, young people, they're looking for a change, I know that narrative very well, but I think looking at Marcos, Corey, uh, Pinoy, uh, you know, and everyone in between, um, it's like we romanticized Corey. Uh, we heroized, you know, her and didn't look at complex things like the failure of land reform, the rise of vigilante groups, uh, you know, uh, the income inequality. I'm not saying, I love Dita Corey. I'm just saying that we Filipinos in particular, uh, number one, we expect the president to answer everything. Because mm -hmm. our middle class is so small, um, it's like the president is to blame for the weather, is to blame for, you know, the fact that my father had enough care. You know, it's just sort of constant. Um, and I think here the middle class is quite large. And so you see people taking greater responsibility. But um, I think we need to be a little realistic. I mean, the fact of the matter is that uh, Biden and Harris are very pro-Zionist, um, you know, and, and, and that's not necessarily good or bad, but it certainly hasn't made Palestinian Arabs happy. Mm. So I'm just saying everybody has in their life, you know, all kinds of cognitive dissonance. Um, okay. And the sooner we realize that we are human all too human, the better it is, I think. So does that mean, uh, Kom Goyo, that the story of the U.S. in 2020 may not necessarily be the story of the Philippines in 2022? I mean, Lila talked about the divisions between just the Filipino-American community, right? So, and I mean, we have the same kind of division here in the Philippines. They say, but then when you look at the surveys, you know, when you... President Duterte has a 91% approval rating. That doesn't sound like to me a division. That sounds like to me a resounding approval of President Duterte's uh, performance. But you know what? That's what normally happens. The sitting president has a high approval rating, but yeah. the president in the next election loses. It's, it's almost all too common. So there's not there's never been in recent history the bet of an incumbent president winning the next presidential election. I might be wrong, but my understanding is, yeah, the bet normally loses because people want change. But, uh, okay, you're there. Uh, we might not like you. We might like you. But since you're there, we'll have to live with you. But it stops with you. The next admin has to be different. And that's that's I think a common common sentiment of a lot of voters. So, but what uh, kind? But what kind of change um, do Filipinos want yeah. this time around? Because I mean, that we're always talking about change, right? And Duterte obviously won on a platform of change. 
But now, to me, it seems like we're not really seeing a, a whole lot of change. So okay. this time around, do Filipinos want the kind of change that they're seeing in America right now? In other words, are there? do you see that Filipinos are getting inspired by what's happening? So. In America? I think so, because, you know, um, the last two elections, right? Uh, President Aquino won after the term of President Arroyo because he was... A, he was exactly what President Arroyo was not. So they wanted somebody different from President Arroyo, so they chose President Aquino. President Duterte won because he was the exact opposite or the opposite of President Aquino. Uh, whatever you did not like in President Aquino, you found in President Duterte. So people have a tendency to, to want something different from the status quo. Um, Change can be different, can mean different times at different to different people at different times. Um, you might want somebody who's more empathetic as compared to the previous president. You want some somebody who's more aggressive in forcing the the interests of the Philippines. So it it varies. But again, what's important is not change because change is the that's a that's a standard cry of a lot of politicians but you should be changed for the better change to make things better i hope people realize that you can achieve that but you have to you have to work hard for it mm -hmm. and um, in terms of uh, yes lila yeah i i just want to say that um i was an assistant secretary under the pinoy administration and um i would say that you know Arsenio Balisacan and uh, Dinky Soliman, I mean, they really worked hard on trying to fight poverty. And uh, part of the problem, I think, is that long-term social and economic change takes time. And you need a return on investment, for example, for your conditional cash transfers. It's like 8 to 12 years minimum before you see a dent in the data. By then, bago na ang presidente. And I've, I've served three presidents, and I've noticed that they tend to throw out the baby with the bathwater. You know, it's like... All presidents have had uh, good uh, sides and not so good sides. And I think for the Philippines to progress, there's got to be some kind of policy continuity. Like I understand, you know, Nene Pimentel and the local government code. I see the value of wanting to move away from Imperial Manila. But to change your leadership every three years at the local level, it means, for example, when I was in UNDP, it meant it was impossible to convince mayors to invest in trying to find out, for example, a new maternal mortality rate, Sabayan Nino. They're not gonna do it because they're thinking that in three years, you know. Uh, I'd rather use that money for the next round. So I, I'm, I'm concerned that we're always reinventing the wheel. Um, more than other countries that I've seen, uh, I'm also concerned that we keep repeating the same mistakes. And I think that it's very much because I think Corey and Pinoy drop the ball in education. I mean, in our school textbooks, there should be more on martial law today. Mm. And there's no reason why the millennials should forget, except that the educational institutions at some level have failed them. Mm. So, okay. you know, when we talk about education, it's always building schools, building classrooms. It's not curricula you know, which is very important. Oh, right. I think there's a lot to unpack there in terms of electoral reform. And I think that's probably a, a whole other show. Yeah. Um, but yeah. just real quick, Com Goyo. Yes. Um, you, do you agree with uh, 
Lila, maybe um, in terms of like, you know, extending terms um, with, with the president, for example, we have a one term president. Should we have a two term president? I mean, there's a reason it's one. There's a reason it's a one term president. It's, you know, there's our history, right? That's yeah, why it's it, a one. It should be a two term president with four years per term. Um, yeah. Even with the local government officials, uh, we, in, including me members of both houses of Congress, it should be four years at least. Uh, not not four years, but that's it. Not not five, not six. So yeah. um, you can have a term of four years per election. I think that's a good thing for president. Mm -hmm. First two 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 term, um, four years per term. If you're a good president, you'll have eight years. If you're a bad yeah. president, you'll have four years. So you save two years, to So. I think that should be the way. Oh, but the problem with it, if you do that, you have to amend the constitution. If you amend the constitution, how will that be done? To people's initiative, to constitution assembly, to constituent convention. So, you know, with interest of some people, the good intentions to fix term limits, to fix ter to fix um, uh, foreign direct investment limits in the Philippines. You might, you might also. They, some people might also think about other provisions of the constitution, might which might create more problems than it does solution. So, we when you do that, you have to do that carefully, and you have to do that within the first half of the term of the president. So, oh, now it's too. Late. It now it's too late, of course. Um, but what about the um, political dynasties? Uh, there have been suggestions of um you know um completely doing away yes. with uh, political dynasties but it's a little difficult to even define political dynasties as well as the vice president and president running individually separate from each other different parties and you know we usually end up with a, a president from one party and then a vice president yes. from another party and it's a problem in yeah. fact i i argued in 1998 uh with Comlec, I was still a practitioner back then. <laughs> I argued that you know you can, you should vote for the president and vice president in one as one, so that ensures that you know there's there's harmony yeah. relationship yeah. between vice president. So, yeah, but but there are things there's there's so many things that should be fixed. Um, yeah, in the Philippines, is nobody trusts each other. <laughs> you don't you you. Have, People on opposite side of the spectrum. There's not in much, not, not enough centrist in the states. Uh, Lila will, I'm sure, will agree. There are there are enough people who are focused in institutional policies. Now, no matter who the president is, they do yeah. their job well. In the Philippines, yeah. it's more of they're there because they know somebody. As to your question regarding political dynasties i think more than focusing on the limit on who can run i think there should they should look at who should be appointed in offices say yeah people will say you know i i can be i can i can win because people chose me but you you're only looking at one side of the coin which is the limitation as to people serving government who belong to the same family or relatives. You don't look at people who serve in government who are appointed by elected officials who number more. Like we say, there there can be yeah. an elected official who, who appoints 10 family members to one office. So even if you vote that guy out, those 10 people will still be there. So, you know, when you look at political dynasties, you have to have a look, a holistic approach to it and how to how to help other people who who might have good ideas but are restricted to run or serve in public office because of some limitations. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, uh, yes, Lila. Yes. Um, about dynasties, I was going to say that um, Dean Ronald Mendoza of the Ateneo School of Government makes a big distinction between fat dynasties and thin dynasties. And uh, he would call, for example, the Rojas as thin, 
whereas the B9 is fat because they're all kind of, uh, there are different people in different positions at the same time, right? Uh, he has very amply document, uh, demonstrated that the kinds of fat dynasties that we see in the Congress, as opposed to in the Senate, uh, really uh, worsen poverty rates in the Philippines. So that's the first thing. The second thing I want to say is, in my opinion, um, you know, I watched my uncle run for president. I watched my mom run for the Senate. And, you know, it's an archipelago. So first of all, the logistics of getting around are expensive. And, uh, you know, not everybody has a TV, not everybody has a, a laptop, they have radios, so you have to invest in things like tarps. Um, I mean, in America, I think one of the reasons why there was such a great amount of uh, small contributions to Obama's campaign from the middle class was because of digitalization. I mean, they literally could send money to him in a way that for us, we're still stuck in this cacique discourse, this padrino discourse where, you know, money flows from the top. So, um, uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, and, and also I think, for example, I took the CESO exam, it's really hard. And I don't see why senators and congressmen can't take them too. You know, like if we little, you know, implementers of policy have to do it, I don't see why, you know, Manny Pacquiao should take a test. You know. Mm. So how, you know. how can we change, uh, Kong Goya, how, how can we change this kind of, election culture in the Philippines then I imagine it would it would take time it's not going to happen in 2022 and in relation to that is it possible for us because I I can see that the the pandemic could go well into the end of 2021 during the campaign period so I mean is it possible for us to also conduct our elections the way that they conducted the elections in the US where you know they had early voting for one month you know and mail in ballots and and all that we need legislation for that congress has to pass a law but i, I have to point out something when you talk about digital campaigning uh the philippines was actually in the forefront of digital campaigning and and if you read reports uh facebook test and some 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 organizations tested used the philippines as a as a testing for the 2016 elections in the u.s so um how do you how do you how do you maximize things now? How do you make things better to allow voters not only the opportunity to vote, but the opportunity to vote wisely? There's so much fake information now, not from legitimate media, definitely not from legitimate news sources, but from social media, by troll accounts shared by hundreds or dozens of fake accounts that creates an algorithm and convinces people that even if it's fake, they think that, hey, you know, this is fake, but I've read it from 20 accounts, it's like, it must be true. So how do you counter that? How do you counter misinformation to be sure that when you vote in 2022, you can vote wisely? I have to stress though, there, you can't put property property qualifications, I mean to say you cannot let candidates take exams, you cannot even require them to file RTRs, but you can empower the voters to allow them to choose wisely next time. But Anna, stop, stop with the sound bites, stop with the, but with the battle cries that are good to hear, but doesn't amount to much. You, the candidates should focus on not sound bites, but policy for the country. I mean, say yeah. policy not only for my term, but if it continues, will do the Philippines good for the next thirty years. I, think I, I hate them. to say this, but it's not it's not even sound bites. It's, you know, uh, politicians <laughs> like enter entertaining the masses, uh, going on stage and singing and, and dancing. No, but yeah, that, can I say something? I, I think that 
the voting public also has to take responsibility. Um, I, you know, there are countries where uh, leaders are uh, bureaucrats with absolutely no charisma and who are uh, completely solid, like Austria, for example, you know, and I think it's outlandish that we uh, want, I mean, my, my mom, for example, had to learn how to dance, you know, <laughs> it's like she wasn't a very good dancer, actually, but I'm just saying, you know, um, and another thing is a lot of people in the provinces, they want to be bribed. And I understand the larger narrative there that the poverty makes them uh, wait for election season so that they can get some money. I understand that. But um, I think this whole notion that a movie star or a, or a, or a, uh, boxer, you know, because they can make jokes and because they're entertaining and they're funny, you know, they're going to solve everything. And I just think that's entirely silly. You know, I mean, we really need to look for people who understand laws, policies, economics, of human rights, you know, people who may not be charismatic, but who are educated. So in I this case, time, yeah, I wrote about that one time when um, people want something sexy. They don't want to think they don't. They, you know, you see a candidate there. How many candidates have have gone on stage and talk about policy development and people clap? But you know, there are some candidates who bring entertainers with them. Good entertainers, I must stress. People laugh, clap, and at the end of the day, they end up voting for that person because you know they were entertained. And I think that's what people. I agree with Tira. That's what people should understand. Politics is not entertainment. Politics is governance. It's not. You're yeah. not there to sing and dance. You're there to yeah. Yeah. formulate policy. Right. So and clearly, so clearly, yeah. iba yung iba yung election culture natin sa election culture sa America. So it's not it's like changing. we can compare. Yeah. It's changing. It's changing. There are more people involved now. There are more people um, aware of what needs to be done. But you know, when you when you make change to the election culture or, or the mindset of Filipinos, it takes time. Uh, hopefully, we'll get there soon. Okay, Lila. Yes. Um. First of all, uh, Goya, about Facebook, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, you're, a few years ago, Maria Ressa was already talking about how it uh, has been weaponized by dictators. Uh, and, you know, other countries have talked about it, Russia, whatever. And it's only now, which, which means that's a good thing, you know, Facebook and Twitter are not allowing Trump's fake news. So, kahit mabagal, you know, they're listening. So, but if we could just look at the big picture for a moment, I mean, first of all, it's the global rise of migration. It's uh, COVID, xenophobia, nationalism, populism. So, it's a kind of deep globalization. You know, it's like the EU is breaking apart with Brexit, you know, with countries not wanting to help each other um, in the context of COVID. So this is the kind of chaos that populism feeds into. And I think the other thing is, I feel, and, you know, I mean, my friends and, you know, they, they argue with me, but... I feel that people are getting dumber and dumber. And, you know, my scholar friends jump up and down. How can you say that when there have been so many noble ganyan, ganyan, okay? Um, what I'm trying to say is when I was 16, I had to, I read a book from cover to cover under a tree. Today, my nieces and nephews, you know, I can't, I noticed they're on five screens at the same time. 
right? Now, that doesn't mean they're any less intelligent. It just means that there is less, it's kind of a collective attention deficit disorder. You know, we're all just like so distracted that we can't follow through cognitively an idea. And the internet has a very low intellectual ceiling. It's not like going to a library and reading. So, I mean, this entire context is a disaster. Um, but I mean, if you, you know, I mean, I know we don't have so much time, so maybe we should talk about the Philippines and how Biden will, I don't know. Right, yeah. right. No, I mean, yes, I was going to go there, the the big picture. So, yes, you're right. We, we really don't have much time anymore. So I'm going to go there. What is the biden presidency mean for u.s philippines relations especially in terms of two things okay so human rights right because donald trump was seen as an ally of president duterte you know someone who would let president duterte slide with his uh, perceived if not perceived but yes human rights abuses within his drug war and then the other thing is the south china sea context, of course, because that is a huge part of the U.S.-Philippines, um, you know, security, military relationship. Is anything going to change with the Biden presidency? Okay, can I, I have a few things to say about yes. that, but uh, Goyo, I don't want you to feel I'm doing all the talking, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I'll give Goyo the... Yeah, the chance to yeah, comment on that after you speak, yes. Okay, so first I would say that um, the U.S. behaves like other imperial powers. It's not any different, I mean, in terms of power containment. Um, this country, I mean, millions are affected by finance, capitalism, and militarism, blah, 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 right? And, and, and information war. Um, there are so many U.S. bases all over the world uh, in 70 countries. So uh, it's not, so the notion that America is benign, right, or benevolent, you know, is, is, is I mean, relative to China, you know, possibly, yes. Um, but let's not fool ourselves that they're going to do what's in their strategic and economic interests. Okay, that said, uh, you know, and I would say the difference between Trump and Biden is that Trump's uh, policies, you know, were, were done with executive orders that were so uh, ephemeral and precarious and... Um, spontaneous. I think with Biden, you might see uh, a kind of more durable domestic and foreign policy because he will work for ratification of conventions. He will work with Congress. He's kind of a by the book guy, right? So there's that. Now, Biden has not been perfect on foreign policy, like the war in Iraq, blah, blah, blah. On the other hand, um, you know, I think uh, what's interesting about the Philippines is the DFA will be completely pro-America in one administration and then shift uh, entirely towards China on another. And you, you, you know, apropos of policy, policy continuity, I ask my friends, I mean, you know, it's vertiginous, right? The shift. Um, I think, but it should be noted that although uh, there is a lot of theatrics coming from Duterte, the defense and foreign policy establishment has always wanted, uh, generally wanted an American presence in the Philippines. So number one, he's gonna, Biden is gonna support the 2016 arbitral ruling uh, in favor of the Philippines, so that's important. 
Um, and then the other thing is the U.S. presidential term coincides with um, the third there for about a year and a half, right? Yeah. So now uh, Teddy Boyd has just extended the uh, visiting forces agreement, okay, on the eve of the apparent win of Biden, right? So um, if there are no changes in our policy, then the mutual defense treaty will eventually be abrogated within the first year of Biden's term, okay? So that's important. Now, the, I'm uh, sorry, the mutual defense treaty or the visiting forces agreement? The, well, the visiting forces agreement operationalizes right. the mutual right. defense treaty. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so there are basically three things. It's it's like EDCA, uh, yeah. VFA, and mutual defense treaty. Now, for example, we've had around three hundred joint military activities uh, with the U.S., and that would could be halved with the abrogation. Now, it seems to me that on the one hand. Um, Biden doesn't tolerate, it's going to be a lot tougher on human rights mm. than Trump, for whom it was not a priority at all. And he doesn't like dictatorship. He doesn't like the lack of democracy. And he said that this is going to be one of his pillars to fight for uh, democracy all over the world. On the other hand, uh, he may dance with the Philippines and dance with Duterte because he may want a restoration of the uh, visiting forces agreement. Um, now, if uh, you, know, you notice Ambassador uh, Kim uh, was so polite, no matter how rude uh, Duterte was to him. So they're, they're trained to be very uh, to have equanimity. Now, if Biden publicly criticizes uh, Duterte and human rights and imposes sanctions again, like with Senator Bato, um, you know that 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 the bluster and bravado, the masculine bluster and bravado of Duterte and his people are such that they're probably going to say, "Ah, hindi natin kailangan ng America." you know, for a period, right? Now, um, EDCA, uh, it's, it's going to reach, in 2024, it will reach its 10-year mark. So my, my thinking of it is that there's so many problems domestically for, for Biden that I don't think uh, – He's go well, he may not make the same rhetorical mistakes that Obama did. Obama was the typical, you know, American uh, upfront, hey, Mr. Duterte, what do you have to say about well, those human rights violations? You know, I think Biden is a lot more cautious than that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now I think, um, it's the great power competition between China and the U.S. I, I've noticed, you know, we've gone from you know, under Pinoy, very pro-American, and then under they're very pro-Chinese. Um, and I think we, I hate to say it, that, you know, our foreign policy is such that, you know, we're pretty sip sip. And um, it's like whoever... You know, has more, you know, and, and my criticism of Duterte is that, you know, it's not as if there are no problems with Chinese imperialism and Chinese human rights violations. I mean, it's fine to be critical of America, but, you know, be balanced. So I think to end, I, I think that uh, Duterte may offer enhanced security cooperation. Uh, if Biden offers tangible trade and investment deals. And of course, a lot will depend on who wins the COVID 
vaccine race. Right. So it, it sounds to me like, and correct me if I'm wrong, fundamentally, the t- ties between the Philippines and the U.S. will not change as much um, because of also because of you know uh, Biden's experience in foreign relations. He was the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in the U.S. for some yeah. time. So yeah. I think he, I, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Lila and, and Kom Goyo, I, I think he knows this game. He knows this yeah. game. But Kom Goyo, as someone who lives in the Philippines, as someone, because, you know, Lila, I, you know, you lived in the Philippines as well and until recently. You just yeah. moved to the U.S. very recently. So you also know yeah. what's happening here. But Kom Goyo, I, I, I want to ask you, do you look forward to a President Biden who actually intervenes in human rights abuses in the Philippines because there are two schools of thoughts here in the Philippines, you know, where people say we don't want a foreign country intervening in our domestic affairs. But then there is a segment in Philippine society that wants the U.S. intervening because they don't see the Philippine government acting on these issues. Pretty simple. My rule is pretty simple. The most, do the most we can to save lives, and if we can, we can achieve that in whatever way and means possible. Then for it, right? I say at this point in time, we need to save lives uh, of, fel- of fellow Filipinos. One thing I would like to add now, as compared to the current administration of Trump, um, you know that the, the administration of Biden will be policy driven. That he will make policies based on. He will make decisions based on the U.S. interest, not not policies based on their own self-interest, self-wealth, diba? Na how can they profit from it? Um, hopefully, that will that will make discussion better. Because you know that the the other side is pushing for programs that are based on inherent uh, inherent trust to make sure things will be better, not not de- determine policies based on what can make them richer. Mm-hmm. But for peace and stability, especially in this region, do you think that uh, a Biden presidency would be better? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Much better. Um, at least you have a coherent president, right? Um, and one thing you have to also note is that uh, there, it's it would be it would be easier to discuss policies with a a, a administration that knows what it wants to do. Uh, for me, I think that the the suspension of the the abdicate of, of the stopping of the v- agreement VFA, I think that will be extended and extended and extended and extended. I don't think that will ever get to a point. I might be wrong. I don't think that will ever get to a point that it will actually be stopped. It will just be suspended and suspended and repeatedly suspended until I don't until know of course the end of the Duterte administration yeah. I think so and then, and then we'll see what happens there right yeah. can I say something about the yes, notion I want to say something about the notion of interference because I hear that from a lot of Filipinos na parang, Bakit sila nakikialam? you know and I I just want to add that if you decide, never mind U.S. interference, okay, because we don't want individual countries interfering in our business. I understand that. On the other hand, when you join uh, an institution like the United Nations, okay, the point of being in that community in the first place right, is that you have a forum in which you can all talk among yourselves and it's not only the rich countries, it gives, of course, the Security Council is powerful countries, but the General Assembly gives people, uh, poor countries, a space in which to express themselves. So we have benefited so much from the UN, even now with this new Baguio, Ulysses, the UN is helping. And, you know, Filipinos treat the UN like they treat the SWS, 
It's like if it makes them look good, they love it. If the survey makes them look bad, it's bullshit. And I think, um, you know, the UN, when all these UN bodies say, hey, there are human rights violations in the Philippines, it's not about America. It's about all these nations. Now, mm -hmm. one problem with the Trump administration is it has pulled out of so many multilateral organizations. Now, the U.S. record in terms of international conventions is pretty bad anyway. But under Trump, it just reached a serious, colossal low. And what does that mean? It means that in the U.N. system, there are all these Chinese officials in very powerful positions. And one of the, uh, if you talk to people in the Human Rights Council um, in Geneva, and if you, you talk to people in the Human Rights Commission, they will say China's whole thing now is don't interfere with anybody in terms of human rights. That's Myanmar, you know, genocide. Don't talk well, about Well, because it. they also don't want other countries interfering in their own situation in yeah, China. But, but uh, the notion, it's, I mean, I think people don't understand what the UN system is about. I mean, it's it, those, you're supposed to intervene like when a Rwandan genocide is happening. You're not going to intervene just any time, you mm. know? Okay, well, um, then one, one final question for both of you then, because we've run out of time. Does Duterte or should Duterte fear the incoming Biden presidency, given that it's a return to democracy, a return to multilateralism? Biden has been talking about, you know, this global summit for democracy. And I think it might actually happen next year. And of course, the, you know, the perception is that we are sort of under uh, an authoritarian government here in the Philippines. And so kind of doesn't match what a Biden presidency would look would look like. So should the Duterte administration fear a domino effect here in the Philippines? It's a question for both of you. Um, Congo, I want to start. Yeah. Lila, uh, Lila okay. <laughs> Ladies um, I think the thing about uh, America and really any uh, country is it has quite a few, so many stakeholders, right? So many power brokers. So, for example, the CIA has often interfered in political processes all over the world, including the Philippines, right? So. The, there is an anti-democratic, uh, I don't know if you ever read the, uh, the story of the economic hitman, but I mean, there is this, this kind of, uh, you know, let's go to the third world and let's, let's get the resources and let's contain them. Um, I think, on the other hand, uh, I think Biden is going to hold, um, he's going to hold Duterte, uh, he's going to uh, put him to task. Um, I, what is so worrisome is the weakness of the opposition in the Philippines. Um, and, you know, I am hearing very sort of sad, uh, uh, speculations that, you, you know, even people like Lenny Robredo, who are very good, um, may have to uh, go in tandem with less than perfect running mates uh, simply because he's going to need the money and the numbers and the publicity. So, um, you know, uh, I think the the 
the scenario. I mean, who is America going to endorse? Um, you know, it's complicated. But um, to answer your question, I think Duterte should fear, although I don't know that uh, the man has the equipment. So. <laughs> okay. All right. Kom Goyo, your comments. Uh, and, and, and as well as, I guess, you know, do you think that the U.S. Will get involved in our elections in, in 2022, both the U.S. and China? Uh, first, is I think uh, Philippines shouldn't fear the U.S. In fact, it was one of the countries who initially congratulated President-elect Biden uh, in his win after it was called. Um, you know, my rule is if, you don't, if you're not doing anything bad, why should you be scared, right? So if you're doing something bad, Stop doing it. <laughs> That's it. Um, if the if if you're being called out for doing something bad, you stop doing it and problem solved. Uh, there is a prohibition for other against foreign in in involvement in our elections, uh, but I guess that doesn't stop other countries in trying to meddle, probably with uh, information dissemination or misinformation dissemination. That will help sway the how people vote for or against a particular candidate or party. Um, it sounds really simplistic, but one of the best things you can do is arm yourself with the right information. And how do we do that? We empower people by helping them get the right information, not just all information, but the right information. All right. And on that note, that's all the time we have for our show today. Do catch us every Saturday, regularly at 6 p.m. Again, my name is Barnaby Lowe. This is Viewpoint. Now you know. Thank you very Thank much you for so having me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.